Welcome to Patents, Purpose, and Profits, day three of our uh, virtual summit for inventors. I'm extremely excited to be here with Ron Klein, but before we have him start, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about myself by rapping. And a new idea pops in your brain called a patent professor. That's my name. I'm a law school professor, an engineer too. I think math is fun and patents are cool. When the patent office says your idea is not new, that's just red tape for me to cut through. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay, you, uh, let's, for the, for let's the file that. Okay, <laughs> now the big question is, do you want to do a, a design or do you want to do a, a, a utility on that? Yeah. Oh, uh, oh, I should patent the rap you're saying. Well, right. before I do that, I'm not the real hero. I'm going to, Jenny, if you can play a quick video uh, and I'll tell you who my heroes are and uh, go ahead and play that now. We are Intel, sponsors of tomorrow. I, I got to tell you, like speaking, having you here, Ron, it's it's an unbelievable feeling. I mean, if there is a way to have, get like a virtual autograph through um through Zoom, that would be unbelievable. I mean, to have someone of your your stature. Real real quick though, let me uh, share my screen again. And here you are, purpose, patents, and profits. Those of you, uh, today's day three. Over the last couple of days, we've had an amazing uh, group of inventors, innovators, uh, really game changers. Uh, we, we started off the conference with Kevin Harrington, the original shark on Shark Tank. He's the inventor of the infomercial. Uh, he's launched over 500 products with $5 billion in sales. Uh, oh, sorry, we have uh, Tara Williams, the inventor of Dreamland Baby. Her story is inspiring for any, any inventor uh, that's going through the process now. Again, Dennis and Mary Lou Green, 50 different products, generating $120 million in retail sales. Uh, this is a married couple that have managed to remain married for over 40 plus years while inventing. They're the developer of the sneaker balls. Uh, Christina Daves is the creator of Casmetic Designs, a serial entrepreneur, award-winning inventor. Uh, she's a top inventor on the Steve Harvey Show. Uh, Wayne Fromm, none other than the inventor of the modern selfie stick, amazing interview yesterday. Uh, Joe Altieri, the inventor of Flex Screen. And today, the final day of our summit, Ron Klein, the inventor of the magnetic strip on the credit card and the multiple listing service in real estate. Uh, Ron is known as the grandfather of possibilities. So Ron, Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for that introduction. That was great. And, and all those people that uh, preempted me before, I'm honored to be the, the, uh, the catch up on the last. Thank you. <laughs> well, my philosophy is, is pretty simple. And that's pretty much what my philosophy is. Uh, there is no such thing as a problem when it's presented. I say problems are situations. And you can turn every situation into a challenge if you so see where you can make it better. And there's a gift behind every challenge. So uh, that's where all my opportunities came from. And uh, my basic background is I'm a, a graduate engineer and I have a math degree also, but I was always known as the problem solver who turned things into a challenge. And I was the, the liaison between the consumer, the customer, and the engineering departments, and I enabled them to communicate because I said simplicity. That's what you have to do. You have to be smart, daring, and different to really participate. What I mean by smart is it doesn't necessarily mean the PhD from Harvard. It means learn something new every day. Be aware of what's around you. You don't have to be the, the sharpest knife in the drawer, but you have to be aware. You have to be cognizant of 
where you are in this world. And to be um, it's smart and daring. Daring is don't be afraid to make mistakes because from our mistakes, we learn so much. And I always say simply, if you painted it the wrong color the first time, paint it a different color. But most important, whatever we do in life or whatever we think about, it must provide a benefit. Because if it doesn't provide a benefit, it's no more than just a hobby. So that's my simple thinking. And probably the credit card invention, which was my first big invention, was one of the simplest things that ever came about. Because I always say, and I learned this in, in grade school, mm -hmm. uh, from word problems. You have to identify there's a lot of ancillary information and things that you get in a word problem in school. And you have to sift out what's the given and what's the solution? What's the solution you're looking for? Everything else in between is the minutia. It's just the journey. So a large department store came to me in the early 60s and said, Ron, we, we understand that with your engineering background, you are a good problem solver and you can identify problems. I said, well, it's not a problem. We'll turn it into a challenge. And they said, it takes too long to do a charge purchase. And that's what they called them in those days. The credit card just had an embossed number on it and the name. And then the merchant had to look up that name and number in a long book of things that the, the credit card companies would give them every month for negative account numbers. And that took quite some time. So one of the problems was it takes too long to make a charge purchase. Yeah, so let me, situation. Oh, sorry, Ron, let me uh, uh, interrupt you for a second because you have an old associate, uh, uh, Kenneth Passero, who says uh, he knows you from the New York Stock Exchange and has asked if I would say hi to you. <laughs> hi, hi, Ken. How are you? And, and it's, a, it's a good, it's a perfect point time for an interruption anyway, because we found this amazing video. Uh, Jenny, if you can play that, and it kind of shows exactly what you're talking about of how oh, okay. magnetic card, how, uh, how merchants were, what they were having to do. It's unbelievable. Turn up the volume, Jenny, and let's... let's About 609 million credit cards that are in existence just here in the U.S. When I hear those kind of numbers, I almost have to be apologetic. I grew up right out of the Depression, and I was just a very, very inquisitive kid, very inventive, coming up with all my own toys. By the time I turned 18, the Korean War was on, I was drafted, and after I came back from the service, people were making what they called charge purchases. They would come in with their credit card, which had an embossed number on it, and the merchant would have to look up that credit card number on a long list of negative account numbers that they were given every month by the credit card companies. Right around that time, reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders came out, and I figured, I've got a great idea. If I could take a piece of tape and record the account number on that piece of tape, paste it on the back of the piece of plastic, and build a device that mimics a tape recorder so that if I inserted the card and pulled it out rapidly, it could possibly work, and it did. And that was the invention of the magnetic tape on the back of the credit card. I was delighted when I saw all the problems it solved amongst all the department stores in which we installed it. Never made tons of money off the patent, but I made tons of money when I came up with lots more ideas and inventions with the development of the nutrition system to raise chickens in eight week period, the development of MLS, the multiple listing service for the real estate industry, the development of voice response for the banking industry, which eventually took me into the New York Stock Exchange and I was there for over a quarter of a century developing things for the exchange. My nickname and what I'm known for is I'm the grandfather of possibilities and that's me. If I had my life to live over again, I would want it to be exactly the same way. A good friend of mine always said, Ron, make sure you live life to the fullest, and when you go, make sure you go empty. The life of credit cards may be coming to an end at some point because we live in a world of obsolescence. However, we've had great longevity of the magnetic strip on the credit card. I don't say weird, but I am different. I'm a free thinker. 
and I just do my thing and I don't worry about what people think. That's my plight in life. Okay, you know what, I'm, I'm glad you played that, John, because what that came out and showed was I took a very simple approach. It was like solving a word problem. What's the given? Takes too long. What's the other thing, the other given? The burden is on the wrong person to make the decision. And the rest is what's the, what's the solution we're looking for? So that solved the problem. Now, because I was an engineer, I recognized and I learned something new every day about tape recorders. If I didn't know that, I would have hired an engineer and said, what other means can we do to automate this credit card? Okay, the other thing was uh, I used my, my ingenuity to come up with the approach as to how do, you, how do you read, you know, I made you the motor because I built a little thing that, that would the mimic the tape recorder, because remember tape recorders, if you would go fast with something, it would sound like Mickey Mouse. And if you yep. slow the tape down, sound like Dracula. So I had to make sure that no matter how somebody ran this thing through this thing, it would make sense. And because I was an engineer, I remember the teletype codes, they had start stop synchronization. So on that little piece of tape in between the account number, I put start information and stop information. So you would push it in slow and pull it out fast. That would solve the problem. So there were situations along the way, but it was a very simple solution. If anybody else was there with me, they probably would have done the same thing. So it's simplifying, understanding the problem and finding that gift behind the problem. And then all of the other inventions follow through. Now I'm still not empty yet. So I'm still making, doing other inventions along the way. But the company started to grow rapidly. Here's the negative parts, okay? The company started to grow rapidly as I was building it because we had these inventions and we, were, we had lots of orders. I needed money. I had to go out and raise money through funding. I had to learn how do you raise capital. And then we, the company even grew larger and I had to figure out, well, how do we, we need more money now? Well, I went back to the investors and they said, we'll take it public. I knew nothing about an IPO. I went and got myself a, a copy of the 1934 Securities Act at the library, read it cover to cover. I became an expert at the S1 registrations, put together a prospectus, took the company public. And now we had all the negative situations as to I had draftsmen, engineers, production people, because there was no software in those days. So I had to build everything from scratch. And we were building MLS units for multiple listing, voice response for the banking, and it was just growing rapidly. But the company was doing well. It just needed a lot of money. Some of the investors came back to me and a large, very large insurance company came to me and said, we like what you're doing. We'd like to acquire you. Well, I was 34 years old at the time and I figured maybe it's time to retire. <laughs> I come from a very fancy family. Well, I took the deal started fishing for three days. I became so bored. That's when I figured I've got to go back to work. That's when my career really started and all the problems and headaches came about. Here's the negative aspect. I didn't know what I was going to do. All I knew was I didn't want 125 employees anymore in big manufacturing facilities. All I wanted was residual income. So I figured I would sell other people's products, call on old clients until I came up with a good idea. And while I was calling on a major user of teletype equipment, I saw a bid sheet on his desk and it was from Western Union. And they, I said, what is this? And he said, oh, well, you know, we're in the communications business, big in the communications business. We, we use these teletypes constantly and re Western Union puts them up for bid every week. They refurbish them. And he said, but we have more inventory that we need. You're welcome to take the bid sheet. That changed my life. So in a lot of times, these are industries that you're not, was it an obstacle to you? Like, for example, with the, you are not in the credit card business at all, or that industry. At all. Uh, how do you feel as an outsider to that industry uh, trying to, you know, trying to 
solve a problem? Like, didn't did it? Was that an obstacle? Thinking, gosh, who am I to to address this? They've thought of it already. John, here's the important thing: I didn't invent the credit card. I just made it better. So I looked at that as an an issue and a challenge of what is the problem, and the problem was something took too long, and the burden of auth authenticity was on the wrong person. It didn't make any difference whether it was a credit card or anything else. Right. And I looked at that as saying, I think I can fix it by speeding things up because I simplified it and understood the problem. Now, along the way, I did try other things. I tried punching holes in cars and all kinds of things. And then I recognized because I was a very inquisitive engineer, the mag tape, the uh, magnetic tape reel to reel system. And I figured, well, I know how that works. I, I learned about it. What else can I do with it? Or can I use this to help my problem? And that's so what your people have to think about out there is you don't have to be necessarily an inventor. You have to be an innovator. How do you make things better? The man who, who invented the paperclip, he only didn't only invent the paperclip. He made it better because there were other types of clips, staplers, and so on and so forth. So there are many innovations on how do you join two pieces of paper together. Same thing as to how do you make the credit card better. But but sometimes I did. Like like going back to your paper clip example. Let me grab a post-it and you'll see. Sometimes the brilliance of an inventor is in realizing, it's just in realizing the problem. I mean, you're very humble when you said. When you say that this was solving this was a it was a simple solution, but you identified the problem. I mean, here's the the inventor of the, the post-it note. Like paper and tape have existed forever before this product. Somebody realized that hey, there's a need for replacing paper and tape. And here, here's like another example, like a, a sleeve on a cup of coffee. Jay Sorensen licensed this idea. It's but it's realizing that there's a demand. I mean, here's. Uh, the final one, like some, you know, uh, Ron Brown realized that when people see a label upside down, they start, it's a human instinct to turn it right side up. And now you don't have to hit the back of the catch up to get it out. It's, exactly. realizing, it's realizing the demand, but not being in retail, how, how are you even aware that, well, I guess as a consumer, when you go to run your card, you would see the store, like in your video, go through Slow their- down. At Christmas time, it would it would queue up a long line of people waiting while somebody was trying to run their card. But it's so it's really innovation. How do we make things better? With all the problems that are out there in the world today, people have to somewhat reinvent themselves and think about what do they see that can be made better and approach that in another way. My biggest gain was at the New York Stock Exchange now being on the trading floor every day. And, and keeping my technician and the ability to maintain those machines, I was able to look around and say, what else can I do for these people? So I was constantly, rapidly, I, I came up with program trading and building little boxes here and there and fixing things. And then the big thing was in 1983, I saw the, on the bond trading floor, New York Stock Exchange did two things. They sold and marketed equity, stocks and they also sold debt instruments bonds so that was the debt on the equity that they had at the exchange the equity system and the stock brokerage systems were automated a long time before that but they were still using an auction system for the corporate listed bonds so i went on the bond trading floor and i see these guys throwing their hands up and down bidding and they're on the phone and i figured that's so simple to automate because they had the main line with bond information coming out, why don't I just take a little filter box, build a little box to filter out only the bonds and connect it to a video terminal. And I came up with a solution on how to automate that. So I went to the exchange and I said, I can automate this so easily. And they said, Ron, they've been doing it like this for 205 years, they're not gonna change. And I said, okay, if I can build something that can automate this, Will you give me an exclusive license to be a bond disseminator for all of New York Stock Exchange member firms on Wall Street? They said, yeah, because it'll never happen. Oh, okay. Well, I built a little box, gave it a video terminal, went down to the bond trading floor, 
put it in, worked beautiful. I started making phone calls to all the brokers, the bond brokers on Wall Street. And if I wasn't buying or selling a bond, they would hang up on me. I figured, how do, what am I going to do now? I came up with this invention, this betterment, and I can't sell it. Right. So I befriended the biggest bond manager on Wall Street. And I went to his office and I said, I'm going to run a communication line to your office and give you a little box and a video terminal free for 30 days. Just try it. Well, we did that. And within two weeks, all the guys on the trading floor were starting to say, called him up. His phone rang off the hook and they said, what are you doing? We can't buy a bond. You're topping every bond we try and buy. He said, oh, you need one of those little old Ron Klein boxes. My phone rang off the hook wow. and I formed the club and I said, okay, you have to give me $10,000 to join my club. And there were many thousands of guys out there. I said, you have to join my club for $10,000 to be an automated bond trader. And they said, well, we can get that money back in a couple of months and it's pretty expensive. They did it. And I said, well, now you have to buy the little box in the video terminal. And they said, no, we don't buy anything on Wall Street. We only rent equipment. Well, the box in the video terminal cost me $100. I said, how's $300 a month? Fantastic. And they, it was in there for a quarter of a century. So <clears throat> this is the opportunities you can see by taking an opportunity and a, and a, a challenge and turn it into a winning game pulling function. That's amazing. And when you say a quarter of a century, uh, I would think, I mean, the, the, the credit card, uh, the chip is relatively new. I mean, since I was, I don't remember cards before the magnetic strip. Has that surpassed a quarter of a century? Well, the patent, I filed the patent in 1966 and it was awarded in 1969. Now, and it's, the reason it's so, it was so successful, and I believe it's still successful, is the magnetic strip doesn't require energy. If it doesn't require energy, the law of engineering is it can't radiate. It can't transmit if it's not energized. The chip is wonderful, but I'm not a big fan of it because we the chip is a little computer. When you put that chip in the machine, mm -hmm. the machine energizes the chip Okay, there is an algorithm and so on and so forth to make it very, very secure. But when you put that chip in the machine, the chip is energized and guess what happens? It now becomes a transmitter. Somebody behind you in the line a few feet down can have a scanner and say, thank you very much. And that's how your cards get compromised. That's why they now sell sleeves to shield the card so that it's not energized. If somebody comes up and energizes it with a scanner, in your back pocket, but I don't. I don't want to throw the thing under the bus. But that's what it's got to be. I mean, we've all been to stores that where the chip reader is down, so it's got to be a great feeling for you to <laughs> go into a store and say, you know what, our chip reader is down right now. Uh, we're going to have to run your card with the magnetic strip right. again. And <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but you know, there was never fraudulence at the point of sale with the magnetic uh, strip. It was always the man in the middle or, or down at the server. And that was the interesting thing. Now, the invention or the enhancement for the bond system, that grew because it finally it went from the New York Stock Exchange, the American Stock Exchange, the Philadelphia Stock Exchange, the CBOE, and it just grew and grew and went into the treasury market. So the point is, all I did was read a guy's back, a bid sheet on his desk when I was trying to sell him some communication equipment. Wow. Being smart, daring, indifferent. Pay attention, learn something new every day. You don't have to be the sharpest knife in the drawer. You just have to be aware. Well, and, and willing to learn. And that's, that's, and, and being, I mean, your, your humility is, is so refreshing because here's, yeah. you know, you're, you're like, oh, every, you know, this was simple and that was simple, but you know what? Like identifying a, the problem itself, sometimes that's where the genius lies. Yeah, I mean, identify the problem, turn it into a challenge. First of all, I don't call anything a problem. It's a situation. Mm -hmm. Some situations can be turned into a challenge. If you can turn it into a challenge and you understand it and simplify the challenge, 
there's going to be a gift behind that challenge. And I, I look at, the, as, <coughs> excuse me, I look at challenges as <coughs> a little house with a front door. And I say, I open the front door and I look at this house. That's my challenge. And I look around to make sure that there's a window or a back door. Because if there's not a back door in that little house, I don't walk in and close the front door behind me. If there's a back door, worst case situation is I'll go out the back. So that's where I say, if it's a challenge and you you look at this and you solve the, you look at the challenge and solve it, you say to yourself, what's the worst thing that can happen? I'll paint it a different color. If I paint it at the color at the wrong time, at the first time, same thing. So that's the approach I look at. And there's always some opportunity behind every challenge. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's now, amazing. With patents and ideas, I know this is your your baby. You can fully understand. <laughs> Consider a, a, a provisional. A provisional patent is great. It gives you the opportunity for having a 12-month window before you can carry it to the next level. And there's so much you can do with a provisional patent. It's very difficult to file, very simple to file. It just needs an abstract, a narrative, and some kind of either description or flowchart of what your idea and your concept is. It goes through the patent office in four to six weeks. It's been given an, a, uh, an application number, and then now you're patent pending. So that gives you that with the non-disclosure letter. Now you can go out and talk to the marketplace you're ready to see, do you have something that's marketable? Do you have something that maybe you want to license off to have them take it to a utility patent? And there, there are many functions. So the biggest mistake you can make is file the provisional too soon and you run out of the 12 months. Best thing you can do is do your searching first, search the heck out of it, analyze it, test the market, question, and then file your provisional. Okay. Now I'm doing some very, very interesting things. Uh, I've got two very big patents going now where I developed within the last four years and it's growing rapidly and I could talk about that, but maybe we should answer some of the questions first. Yeah, so uh, one of the questions relate to your early days uh, because it's it seems like after you've had a couple successes, it's easier to uh, keep up the fortitude and the courage and keep going. But uh, you mentioned before before this that you had tried some other solutions like punched cards and other things. Were there points when uh, you were about to give up? And uh, I've had during the summit, we've heard from several inventors that even put their idea aside and went on with their day jobs and their normal life and then went back to it again. So tell us about that because it sounds well in my early in my early days, first of all, I was very good. Uh, before I was drafted into the military and I went off to the Korean War, I was very good in graphic design, commercial art, and that's what I was really studying, but I really wanted engineering. In my early years, my problem was I thought I had to do everything myself. I never... All your prototyping, all your prototyping you would do yourself. Everything was myself. It always had to be my way. I never started listening until I really started building the big company to find out that all of my people and my employees, they were out in the world and the field, they were out dealing with the customers. If I would listen to them, maybe I would learn a lot more than just saying, well, I got a lot of knowledge. I can do everything myself. That was my biggest mistake. And then once I learned that to listen is to learn and that knowledge is power, I became a whole different person. Um, the mistakes I made along the way um, was because I didn't listen. Well, no, that's that's marvelous. I, we could have, and I just knowing your story, we could have an entire segment on, and you're 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 on the mistakes. <laughs> One quickie, though, I'm sure everybody wants to know where did I get the name, the grandfather of possibilities. I was on a radio show, mm -hmm. uh, and that host invited me for a big dinner in New Orleans because he was going to be down there and he wanted to introduce me to some other people and his wife was with them and they were lovely people. And while we were sitting and having dinner in New Orleans, 
she said, Ron, what, you know, where are you, uh, was your parents inventive? Was your father an inventor? And I said, no, not really. I said, but my grandfather, he was an inventor. He, he had such great capability. And she said, so most of your possibilities came from your grandfather. And I said, wow, what a name. Maybe I could be the grandfather of possibilities. That's how it came about. So I owe it to her, Willie Jolly's wife. He was a, a broadcaster in Washington, Washington, D.C. Okay, well, guys, there you have it. We've heard from an amazing uh, inventor, the grandfather of possibilities, Ron Klein. Such an honor to have you on today. And uh, I hope you enjoy your weekend and the rest of this week. Thank you so, John. Thank you so yeah. much. All right. Thank you.